Welcome to our My IBD Learning virtual program, When to Change Your Meds. My name is Anthony Grizzolano, and I am currently a member of the NCCL, uh, the National Council of College Leaders for the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation. And I just finished my sophomore year at um, Indiana University in Bloomington, Indiana, um, where I'm studying business. So whether you're newly diagnosed or have been managing your IBD for some time, finding a treatment that gets you into remission takes some time and may change over time. Tonight, we hope you gain a deeper understanding of the risks and benefits of different medications, certain factors that may influence treatment changes, and how to navigate discussions about medication changes with your healthcare team with empowerment and confidence. So in order to make this program more interactive and find out how much you've learned tonight, we'll be asking you two different questions via poll on your screen now. So let's start with the first one. Um, improvement in symptoms always reflects improvement of IBD infl inflammation. So uh, do you think this is true or false? Um, let us know what you think and pick the answer you think is correct. All right. And then directly underneath that, you'll find the second question, which of the following could be a reason to change therapy? Again, um, let, let us know what you think and pick whichever one is correct in your mind, like what you think is correct. So um, let's just take a few seconds and uh, pick whichever one we think. And then again, um, once you've selected, at the end of the presentation, we'll ask these questions again and see how much the group has learned. All right, it looks like um, everyone has weighed in. So thank you for your participation. So it looks like most people for the first question selected false, um, interesting. And for question two, it looks like most people selected all of the above. So we are gonna um, find, about, find out about more of these tonight and we'll see if some of our answers change. So on, the on behalf of the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation, thank you all so much for joining. All right, um, the information shared tonight is meant to be for educational purposes only and should not replace any advice or guidance from your own healthcare professional. So um, just for some, just FYI, this program will be recorded and posted on the My IBD Learning website, www.cronescolitisfoundation.org slash My IBD Learning. And everyone who registered for this event uh, will receive a link with the recording sometime next week. So be, be on the lookout for that if you'd like to rewatch, if you miss certain parts or anything like that. Um, and we want this to be as interactive and engaging for all of you as possible. So we encourage you uh, to submit your questions through the question box. It'll be listed as Q&A box, and it's found in the lower part of your screen. So after our expert presentation, um, there will be a moderated Q&A session with all of our panelists, and um, they will address as many questions as they can given the time. All right, so to introduce tonight's speaker, the featured presenter tonight is Dr. Kian Kiyashian. Uh, he has been at Stanford Medicine, Stanford School of Medicine since 2017 and is currently the clinical director of the Inflammatory Bowel Disease Program. Uh, with the goals of improving the outcomes and quality of life of patients with inflammatory bowel diseases, he has collaborated with IBD Pediatric Gastroenterology at Stanford to optimize the care of the adolescent patient population that is trans transitioning care to an adult provider. In addition, his research has focused on older adults with inflammatory bowel disease with an emphasis on epidemiology, early diagnosis, and, and appropriate treatment. So let's all welcome Dr. Kiyashian. We understand the importance of your questions as well, and we want to ensure that we answer as many throughout the night as possible. So tonight, we have the honor of having Dr. Hilary Michael monitoring the Q&A box. Dr. Michael is an attending pediatric gastro gastroenterologist at Nationwide Children's Hospital the director of the Medical Home and Transition Program within the Center of Pediatric and Adolescent Inflammatory Bowel Disease, and, the assist and an, assistant clinical, or an assistant professor of clinical pediatrics at The Ohio State University. Her clinical interests include pediatric gastroenterology with a focus on the care of children and adolescents with IBD. Her research interests center around providing comprehensive care to children with IBD and their families focusing on multi multidisciplinary care delivery and healthcare transition. So if you have a question throughout the night for Dr. Michael, please type it in the Q&A box. She'll do her very best to answer as many questions as she can. Uh, keeping in mind, she may not be able to address every question. So following Dr. Kiyashian's presentation, Dr. Michael will join him for a live Q&A session as well. We do not have any disclosures for tonight's presentation. 
Um, so I guess it's time to get started. So let's get started on tonight's presentation, When to Change Your IBD Medications. At this time, I would love to welcome our featured presenter, Dr. Kian Kiyashian. All right, Anthony, thank you so much for that uh, introduction and uh, awesome job on moderating. I really appreciate you getting this going. Um, I want to thank the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation for giving me an opportunity to talk about this very important topic on when to change uh, medications. So we can go on. Um, so here's here's what we're going to be talking about um, uh, uh, in the next 20, 30 minutes. So we're going to talk about the goals of medical therapy and inflammatory bowel disease. We're going to be talking about the medications for inflammatory bowel disease. We'll talk about symptoms, how to monitor therapy, and then we'll really delve into reasons to change therapy, how to safely transition to that new therapy. And then we'll finish off with some resources looking at shared decision making with your provider um, and additional resources with the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation. Okay. So, you know, as is the case when, when um, any patient sits down with a provider, it's important to understand the goals of medical therapy. So, first and foremost, the goals are to improve symptoms. Terms like remission are applied. So clinical remission means that the patient is asymptomatic and doing well. But additional goals include improving quality of life, normalizing biomarkers, the C-reactive protein, the stool calprotectin, and then healing the bowel wall and the lining. So those are kind of the big global, probably stepped goals of medical therapy, initially symptoms, then biomarkers, then the bowel wall and the lining. But in addition, goals include reducing risk of missed school days or work days, reducing emergency department visits and hospitalizations, reducing repeated course of steroids like prednisone, um, reducing the risk of surgery, and yes, even by healing, reducing the risk of colon dysplasia and colon cancer, which is a low risk. So in the next couple of slides, we're going to delve into medications that we use in inflammatory bowel disease. On this slide, we're going to go over some of the medications um, that are um, available for ulcerative colitis. And on the next, we'll talk about Crohn's disease. Um, it can get easy to get lost in the number of medications that are here. And I really encourage you to uh, use the link that's on this uh, slide to learn more about these therapies. Um, and certainly discuss them with providers uh, to really get delve into the details of safety, effectiveness, and how to best monitor. So the therapies in ulcerative colitis include um, mesalamines and sulfasalazine. These are used in patients with what we call mild to moderate colitis. And then there are therapies that help induce remission, bring about remission, medications like prednisone and budesonide, which are short-term options with the intention of having something else take over for, for long-term remission. There are oral medications, azathioprine and 6 mercaptopurine, which also uh, reduce inflammation and ulcerative colitis. And then we get into the biologic molecules. And there's for ulcerative colitis, there are three classes of biologic molecules. There are the anti-TNF molecules, which block a molecule called tumor necrosis factor, which is increased in ulcerative colitis. There are anti-integrin molecules that prevent the movement of white blood cells to the GI tract. And then there are interleukin blockers, anti-IL-1223 and IL-23 molecules that further reduce inflammation and ulcerative colitis. And I've listed here the, th the three anti-TNF molecules, infliximab, adalimumab, and golimumab, the anti-integrin molecules, vetalizumab, and then ustekinumab and mirakizumab that are FDA approved for ulcerative colitis round out the other biologic therapies. And then we have the small the two classes of small molecules that are FDA approved. There are the JAK inhibitors, which include tofacitinib and upadacitinib. And then there are the S1P modulators, ozanamod and atracitamod. So these round up, uh, round up the uh, list of medications that are currently FDA approved for ulcerative colitis. It's a snapshot, right? So one can imagine that if you talk about this same presentation in five years, you are gonna have multiple other agents. And you can see that a number of agents are moving towards approval in ulcerative colitis and in Crohn's disease, but this is the current state of FDA approved therapies for ulcerative colitis. Mm 
For Crohn's disease, you'll see some of the similar medications. So there are the corticosteroids like prednisone and budesonide. And again, remember the goal here is to induce, to get patients into remission and then have another agent take over uh, in maintenance. These are not meant to be long-term therapies. You see azathioprine and circ 6 mercapta appearing. The pills also appear as therapies for Crohn's disease. There's another medication that can be given either orally as or as an injection called methotrexate, which works very similarly uh, to azathioprine and mercaptopurine. And then we get into the biologic therapies, and you'll see it's the same three classes that were approved for ulcerative colitis. So the anti-TNFs, the anti-integrins, and then the anti-IL-1223s and IL-23 molecules. Some subtle differences here, you'll see sertilizumab is a TNF molecule that's FDA approved as opposed to goldimumab. Natalizumab is an older anti-integrin that is also used, although less frequently in Crohn's disease. And then risenkizumab is an IL-23 blocker that is available in Crohn's, uh, contrasted with mirakizumab. And then more recently, the FDA has approved small molecules for Crohn's disease. So this is where that, that familiar agent, upadacitinib, from the previous slide shows up here. Again, just like I mentioned for ulcerative colitis, number of new agents are moving towards approval for Crohn's disease. And so this list will look different annually, uh, but this is the current medications that are FDA approved for uh, Crohn's disease. I wanna take a minute here because it was one of the questions and it, it's an important one um, to talk about symptoms in inflammatory bowel disease. So in patients with ulcerative colitis, improvement and worsening of symptoms typically does reflect improvement and worsening of inflammation. And this is especially true for patients with stool frequency and bleeding, patients who are having blood per rectum. So that means that if a patient had significant inflammation and the number of bowel movements reduces and their rectal bleeding reduces, in ulcerative colitis, you can feel pretty reassured that they're probably also healing the lining of the GI tract. Now, that's not always true. Patients with ulcerative colitis, for example, 20, 30% of them may also have um, irritability in the GI tract, something similar to a condition you've probably heard of called IBS, irritable bowel syndrome, which can cause symptoms similar to ulcerative colitis. But I do think that in my mind, I do think of improvement in symptoms in ulcerative colitis as generally meaning that things are healing. This is different from Crohn's disease. There is less of this correlation in Crohn's disease. So patients may have no symptoms in Crohn's disease, but may have significant inflammation. That's especially true if they have small bowel Crohn's disease located in the ileum or the upper other areas of the small intestine. On the other hand, patients may also have significant symptoms, but have no significant inflammation. So for example, they may have lactose intolerance or irritable IBD, that irritable component that I mentioned. So I think it's important to understand that while the goal of therapy in ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease is to improve symptoms, this is why we go down the additional steps of looking at biomarkers, looking at healing, because symptoms may not always reflect what's going on at the level of the lining. And one other thing I would say here is what that means is if, for example, there are symptoms, but there's no inflammation, it doesn't mean that there aren't other options to treat those symptoms. It just means that changing your therapy may not be the best approach to get those symptoms to improve. So one thing, whether whether you're on, you've been on a therapy for a long time, or whether you um, are, are changing therapy, is, is is an understanding of how to monitor therapy. Is it working? So um, within days for some therapies, but out to six to eight weeks. You wanna see symptomatic improvement. You wanna see an improvement in stool frequency, how often bowel movement's occurring, stool form, urgency. You wanna have reduced blood in the stools and improved abdominal pain scores. Then after an additional four to eight weeks, you may want normalization of symptoms. That would be a goal. Biomarkers occur, healing occurs, normalization occurs later. So four to 12 weeks, that's where you check the C-reactive protein and the calprotectin. And then healing of the wall, uh, including things I've seen on imaging or colonoscopy occur later, anywhere from three to 12 months later. Colonoscopy, CT, MRI, the newly developed ultrasound uh, in, in the US anyway, uh, can monitor if therapy is working. But this gives you a sense of when those assessments can be done. 
The other thing to monitor other than is it effective is, is it safe? So it's important to review with your provider interactions with other medications and alcohol, for example. So methotrexate, for example, is a medication that can interact with alcohol. So it's important to be aware of these things. Monitoring of safety can also include lab changes, including blood counts, kidney function, liver enzymes. For some of the medications, cholesterol levels, which can be increased with them. Infection risk is an important topic to, for, that needs to be monitored. Tuberculosis, hepatitis B testing, shingles, and making sure of appropriate vaccinations for flu, for pneumonia, and for other um, uh, uh, disease, uh, infectious diseases are, are uh, appropriately administered. Cancer risk needs to be monitored. So skin cancer with some of the therapies, pap smears with medications like azathioprine and 6 mecaptopurine lymph node, liver, spleen exams to look for things like lymphoma, which are extremely rare, fortunately. And then other risks as far as how to monitor safety include bone density studies, particularly in patients that have been on corticosteroids like prednisone for a long time, and then blood clots. Uh, those are other things that it's important to maintain a good communication with your provider with any new symptoms that might then need to be explored. So now let's get into reasons to change therapy. Um, and here there's, there's a good number of them. So um, one would be continued inflammation. So, so we talked about how symptoms can often be a marker of that, like an ulcerative colitis, but beyond that, right? So yes, there are symptoms and the C-reactive protein or the calprotectin is elevated or a colonoscopy shows significant inflammation and an MRI shows inflammation. In that circumstance, it makes sense to either change therapy or optimize the current regimen to reduce inflammation. Um, the other things that can change are complicate changes in the disease itself. So patients in Crohn's disease, for example, may develop fistula, abnormal connections between areas or strictures, areas of narrowing, uh, and that may prompt a change in therapy. Side effects can sometimes result in a change in therapy uh, or changes in risk. Pregnancy may also be a reason to change therapy. Now, I should be very clear here, and, and I, again, refer you to the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation website, a majority of our therapies used in inflammatory bowel disease have been studied and are safe in pregnancy. But there are some, particularly the newer agents, that just don't have that degree of safety demonstrated in pregnancy. And so that, that might be a circumstance. But I would say as a general rule, if you're doing well going into pregnancy, it makes sense to continue that therapy especially if it's one of the therapies, a majority of the therapies that are safe in pregnancy. Another reason why patients change therapy, they might have a change in medication coverage. Their job may change and they may have a new insurance carrier. And those are unfortunately additional layers that may sort of complicate the need to change therapy. I also think it's important that changes in patient preference, what we call life <laughs> may happen. And so maybe a need to travel maybe preferring oral or self-injections over infusions, maybe experiences of family and friends, perhaps more online reading. And then the last reason to change therapy is with the availability of biosimilars, particularly for infliximab and adalimumab, one may consider a change based on the insurance. Um, so let's talk a little bit about that. So biosimilars are uh, biologic therapies that are complex proteins made in live cells just like uh, the three classes of biologic therapies that I mentioned earlier. They're almost identical, so they're near identical copies, but they're technically not generic exact copies. So these should not be thought of as generic because they, they're complex proteins that have to be made in live cells. That's not something that a chemist may make in the back of a pharmacy. They typically have the same active ingredient, the same mechanism of action, how it works, the same dosing, and honestly, the same safety and effectiveness. There is a, a process that the FDA uses for biosimilars to be reviewed and approved, and it's quite rigorous. And they, do, they have done multiple studies to show about switching therapy or multiple switches to demonstrate that the effectiveness and the safety is similar. And this is why, especially for those of you that have been on medicines like infliximab, you may already have explained, expressed, seen some changes in biosimilar uh, uh, uptake. The same is happening more recently with adalimumab, and you will see a number of those. Um, what I would, what I would uh, encourage patients to do when that change is requested is certainly discuss with your provider, but also discuss with your prov provider the cost to you, 
um, and patient support from the company, because those are important things that we, we need preserved if you make a switch from the originator to the biosimilar. So, so and there's another reason for us to potentially change therapy. So how do we transition to new therapy? Well, the important thing here is to have, have open communication with the GI team. Um, a lot of these therapies require pre-therapy labs, updates and vaccination guided by either a pharmacy team or your primary GI team partnering with the primary care provider. Um, keeping an eye out for the approval note or letter is an important one. And I, I, um, I'm sorry to say that part of the burden here is on the patient, but we may not always be the first to hear, the patient might. And so keeping that open line of communication with the gastroenterology office, hey, the medication, I got a notice, it's approved, we're all set. I think that will really help close the loop and can uh, reduce delays in starting the therapy. The other piece of good news that we've learned is that oftentimes there's not a need for a prolonged holiday between different therapies. That an overlap between therapies is safe. It's been studied in case series. The only exception might be a few molecules like the JAK inhibitors and the anti-TNF molecules, but small studies even suggest that that likely is not an issue. So the good news is that there isn't this prolonged period where the patient has to remain off therapy before a new therapy could be started. And then of course, after you change therapy, the, the monitoring that I laid out in a few slides back still needs to happen. You should have a good understanding with your provider of how quickly can I expect my symptoms to get better? Which symptoms are going to get better? So a symptom check-in is the first piece and when will symptoms normalize? And remember the next step is the biomarker evaluation uh, delayed by anywhere from two to four to six weeks. And there you want the blood C-reactive protein, the stool calprotectin, uh, and, uh, and these could be helpful to suggest the next level of healing. And then ultimately a colonoscopy for colonic disease or imaging like an MRI, a CT scan, or an ultrasound may confirm that the small intestine is also healing. So it's that same protocol, whether you're on therapy and you're being monitored or you have a change in therapy, initially make sure symptoms respond, especially in ulcerative colitis where there's that nicer uh, correlation between symptoms and inflammation, then biomarkers, and then uh, colonoscopy uh, and imaging would be the next steps. And, and you can imagine that I didn't mention it in the monitoring slide, but then based on the findings, in other words, if you go into symptomatic or clinical remission, biochemical or biomarker, biologic remission is the term used there, or endoscopic healing or endoscopic remission, and perhaps even an additional layer of healing the biopsies, then over the next year, two, three, you'll have periodic monitoring to confirm that you are still in remission. Part of that is symptoms. Part of it is periodic monitoring of the blood C-reactive protein or the stool calprotectin. Let's talk a little bit about delving into that shared decision-making. So this is really critical whenever you're making these medication changes. And, um, and I think that um, shared decision-making basically means that the patient patient's caregiver, and the health care team work together to make decisions um, about changes in therapy, about continuing current therapy. And consistently, studies show that when there is this shared decision-making, there is an increase in confidence in the treatment from the patient's perspective, but also the provider feeling confident that it's working. There's increased satisfaction with the treatment in both the provider and the patient. And then there's also possibility of sticking with the treatment longer, right? If you recognize that it's working and you have those parameters in mind of symptomatic improvement, biochemical improvement, endoscopic improvement, imaging improvement, then it's more likely to reinforce that decision to continue therapy. So for all these reasons, shared decision-making um, is, is absolutely a must when it comes to these medication changes. What I have on the right here is, we will go over this, but this is from the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation uh, website, specifically about shared decision-making. And so the, the key steps to participating is to get the information. So request and gather all information about your treatment options, including the pros, cons, benefits, risk. Share goals with your provider, values, preferences, certainly insurance coverage and ask for support as you review these options. 
take time to discuss these options, talk through them with your healthcare provider, make a decision together based on medical evidence and personal needs, and then really follow through. So after making your decision, remain in contact with your healthcare team and ask any follow-up questions to make sure that your provider's office is aware and can do those monitoring things for effectiveness and for safety. All right, and I think that ends the talk there. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Kiyashian, for sharing your expertise with, expertise with us. Um, we hope everyone learned a little bit more about medication options, what to expect when you start or switch, and how to have important conversations with your healthcare team. So right now we're working to gather some questions from our Q&A box. Um, but first we'd like to resubmit the two questions uh, we posted at the beginning and see if you know there's kind of a change in the answers now that we've learned a little bit. So now please make your selection to the two questions on your screen. The first question is, True or false, improvement in symptoms always reflects improvement of IBD inflammation. And then beneath that, like the first time, the second question is, which of the following could be a reason to change therapy? So let's take a few seconds and answer these. Okay, awesome. Yeah, it looks like there was a definite... Um, a, a shift in kind of how these results are, um, how we did versus the first and the second time. So the correct answer for the first question is false. Um, in some patients, especially those with Crohn's disease, um, they may experience actually little to no symptoms, but have significant inflammation still. Um, and for the second question, a vast majority uh, got this correct. The correct answer is all of the above. Um, there are several factors that can play the role or can play a role in you and your doctor's decision to change your therapy. Um, and I really appreciate you all taking the time to participate in these polls. Um, now we're gonna take some direct questions from our audience. So I'd like to welcome Dr. Michael on camera, who has been answering questions for us throughout the chat so far. Um, and let's now direct a few of the audience questions to our expert presenters. Um, if you have a question for Dr. Kiyashian or Dr. Michael or both, um, please type it in the Q&A box, which can be found at the lower part of your screen. All right. So our first question is, um, what are some of your thoughts? Um, this is for uh, both. Um, what are your thoughts on combination therapy? Would you ever consider using a med class that initially failed response, but then failed if in combination? And how do you get insurance to cover this off-label practice? So let's start with Dr. Michael. Excellent. Sorry, I'm I'm trying to respond to text questions too. So apologies for um, <laughs> the delay there. Um, so in terms of consideration of combination therapy, um, I think, and actually Dr. Kiyashin and I may have slightly different responses here since I'm a pediatric IBD doc and he is an adult one. So combination therapy, um, and usually we think of using a biologic medication plus an immunomodulator, so those are your methotrexate or your 6-MP, can be really, really helpful for certain patients for multiple reasons. One is that in some patients, it can make the medication level in the body increase, so that it can increase the level of the biologic medication in the bloodstream, which can help heal the bowel better. Um, it can also help prevent the development of antibodies, which there was a question about in the chat, um, sometimes folks' bodies develop antibodies against their biologic medication, and using combination therapy with an immunomodulator can help prevent that or even get rid of the, the antibodies if they form. Um, to hit on the second question briefly, and then I'll hand it over to Dr. Kiyashian, um, I believe it was, if you've been on a medication in the past and it didn't work, what are your thoughts about using it again in combination with a different medicine? I would say we are doing that more and more over time. And I would also say that there is very, very little research on exactly how to do it. So I think if uh, it, it's something that we try, but in terms of exactly how we make those decisions, it gets back to that shared decision-making that Dr. Kiyashian mentioned, 
really weighing the benefits and the risks of different therapies and the combination of therapies to figure out what would be the best for an individual patient. Yeah, I completely agree with Dr. Michael. I especially like the discussion of adding a medicine like uh, a thiopurine or a methotrexate to something like infliximab or adalimumab. And I agree that there's clearly good evidence that that is better. I think um, an equally good question I think is sort of hinted at is, is you know, combination biologic therapies or biologic and a small molecule. And I think that as Dr. Michael nicely pointed out, um, you know, we're just more recently starting to get studies. A lot of these studies are based on a one center's experience or, you know, four or five centers experiences. And so it's not like we have these robust, large randomized controlled trials with a few exceptions, by the way. So company, you know, uh, I think our, our industry partners are recognizing that these combination approaches are going to be necessary. And so you'll find a number of combination kind of trials and a lot of the design of the current clinical trials that do allow you to combine therapies. But my general push right now, short of sort of robust, great evidence is, um, you know, one thing one has to recognize is, yes, you're potentially exposing uh, patients to a higher risk of infection. Now, fortunately, the large studies that we've had have not shown that. But if the medication was never really affected, I, I want some sort of response, right? A partial response that could make, tell me to say, you know what, if I add a different mechanism to this, then maybe we're targeting the Crohn's disease or the ulcerative colitis appropriately. But I would say that in my mind, um, if there is absolutely no change in symptoms and those biomarkers and healing, despite adequately dose therapy, I wonder if maybe adding a therapy to it, at least based on what we know right now, may only introduce risk without necessarily benefit. Um, but the other question that I think Dr. Michael addressed very nicely is I do think that you can go back to old agents. We do that oftentimes with infliximab, and it's because we don't have 35 different categories of treatments. But I do think that that sort of requires a good partnership with the provider and an understanding of how to monitor patient who's been exposed to that therapy previously. That was, thank you so much for um, those wonderful insights. Um, so starting with Dr. Michael again, um, and then Dr. Kiyoshi, if you have anything to add on, um, is it common to test medication antibody levels to proactively inform medication changes? Another wonderful question. So I would say that there are there are two different ways that different gastroenterologists will check medication levels and antibodies. Um, one of them is called reactive therapeutic drug monitoring. So what that means is someone, you're, you were on a, one of our biologic medicines, you're not doing great, having increased symptoms, belly pain, diarrhea, elevation in your inflammatory markers in the blood or in the poop. And so then we would check a medicine level to see, A, is the medicine level adequate? Is it is it good uh, to ideally heal the gut? And B, are there antibodies that are perhaps blocking that, that medicine from working correctly? I would say most gastroenterologists, pediatric and adult, do that. The reactive TDM is what, it, what we call it. The proactive TDM, where we check when you're doing well, it's a little bit of a mixed bag in terms of what different GI docs do. So I can tell you in pediatrics, we are fully on board and we do proactive TDM. Um, uh, again, checking medicine levels and antibody levels. And the thought is that even if someone's feeling good, if their medication level has dropped or they've developed antibodies, if we check when they're well, we may be able to optimize their medicine, give more medicine, give it closer together or add an immunomodulator to get the medicine level back up in their body and make sure that that medicine remains a good one for them. Um, it also helps us figure out if someone's having lots of symptoms or they're having inflammation on their scopes perhaps. It helps us figure out if the drug level is good, but they still have inflammation, it might be time to move on to something new. If the drug level is not so hot and they have inflammation, we can increase that drug level and see if we can help heal them up again. So that those would be my thoughts. Dr. Kiashin, do you have anything to add? Yeah, Dr. Michael, that's perfect. That's exactly what I was thinking. I think that, um, I mean, we have to recognize that we, we lump all the therapies together as biologics, but there's different risk of antibody development with a lot of these therapies. And so I think that's where you see the variability that Dr. Michael's talking about, because some of these therapies consistently show that there's just not a lot of high antibody development. And so in those I think you'll find providers are less sort of getting on board with proactive monitoring. I think the reactive, I agree, almost everyone sort of gets behind. But particularly the TNF inhibitors like infliximab and adalimumab, 
those are agents that I think there's good evidence for significant antibody development uh, with, uh, you know, low levels or with continued low levels. And so I, I, I subscribe to that. And I think a lot of my adult colleagues also subscribe to, you know, proactively monitoring or at least getting it in early in induction into a good place and then feeling confident and maybe monitoring once a year with the infliximab and adalimumab to make sure that things are, are, are stable. Awesome. Thank you both so much for your insights on that question as well. Um, for our next question, Dr. Kiyashian, how do you approach transitioning from dual therapy to monotherapy? Um, and then afterwards, Dr. Michael, um, are there any differences in this approach for pediatric patients? That's great. We have a very savvy audience here. This is uh, using terminology like dual therapy and monotherapy. I like it a lot. Um, so this is this is a great question. Um, I think what we've been focusing on is changing therapy, but, but an, an entirely developing area of research is de-escalation of therapy, right? Of, you know, a patient is doing well, how can we get them on the lowest dose that's still effective, but reduces risk of side effects and, and gets them well? And so I think to me... Um, uh, current the current body of, of literature suggests that stopping um, a biologic therapy, particularly infliximab or adalimumab or any of these agents, there is probably a significant risk of a flare within six months out to three to four years, maybe something on the order of 50%. I should say that means 50% will not. But I think that in my mind, um, we don't have those great predictors yet. So it's a little bit of a gamble of stopping therapy altogether and, and, and remaining off therapy. Um, but I do think that for select patients that are on combination therapy with something like azathioprine 6-MP and infliximab or azathioprine 6-MP and adalimumab, um, and they've done well, so you do all those layers of, that we talked about of monitoring. Their symptoms are better, their biomarkers have essentially normalized, their colonoscopy and maybe even imaging for Crohn's disease has normalized. And you do maybe take this additional step where you look at the level of the drug, you look at the level of the infliximab or the adalimumab, and you find that it's a good therapeutic level. For those patients, especially if they've been on a combination for anywhere from six to 12 months, maybe longer, um, I feel comfortable um, taking the methotrexate or the azathioprine and 6-MP off. The key is to do that and not just say, see you in five years, right? The key is to do that, monitor, you know, maybe a couple of months out, get a calprotectin, um, again, we look at those levels because sometimes, as, as Dr. Michael pointed out, those levels can be augmented by the azathioprine or the 6-MP. Um, and so you want to make sure that the level now hasn't dropped to a sub-therapeutic level if you need to adjust the dose. Um, but I think it makes sense that it, think of it as changing therapy. If you de-escalate therapy, you want to plug back into that monitoring algorithm. How are symptoms? How are biomarkers? How does imaging and colonoscopy look? And I think it's it's very appropriate for a number of these therapies. I'm hoping we get more information because I know I noticed a lot of the questions here are, can we stop therapy? Can we? And I think I, I, those are great questions for Dr. Michael and me too. And unfortunately, right now, we don't have predictors of who those people will be. But I'm optimistic and, and excited about where the research is going in the next five years, 10 years to be able to get into some of that. I agree completely, Dr. Kiyashian. The only tweak I would say, or, or maybe kind of addition I would add as a, as a pediatric GI person is that because we're taking care of kids and teenagers that have decades of life ahead of them, we uh, are, I think, are extra, extra careful about de-escalation. So it might be a different conversation if, if somebody is 90 years old and they say, hey, doc, can I cut my methotrexate, <laughs> you know, and, and you might, and I'm doing well and, and, I mean, maybe they have another 20 years, but who knows? Um, but if I'm taking care of a 14 year old who has such a long life ahead of them with that intestine that we want to keep healthy, um, I would just be a little bit more hesitant to deescalate if someone is doing great um, out of concern that by deescalating or, or going from, again, the combo of medicines to one, that um, they might have a flare up and agree completely. Very close monitoring with any therapy change is key, both clinical symptoms, uh, symptoms in the office, growth and development in our kids and teenagers, blood markers, poop markers, repeat scopes. Awesome. Um, Dr. Kiyashian, um, do certain biologics take longer to start to work for patients? Um, and then Dr. Michael, if you have anything to add. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, yeah, they, they are. Um, so the guide, by the way, the uh, the monitoring that I, I mentioned to you is part of an initiative um, through the International Organization of IBD called the STRIDE Initiative. 
um, a reiteration of that. And basically, um, it sort of first of all says that we should be doing this tiered approach, symptoms first, biomarkers next, uh, endoscopy, colonoscopy, imaging, ultrasound, eventually. But I think there is some evidence to suggest that there are some differences in how quickly th treatments onset um, and, um, and uh, you know, get to their full level. So that's why I give you those ranges when I talk about when to monitor those specific parameters, because a, a classic example is um, that we tend to think of some JAK inhibitors as relatively quick acting and ulcerative colitis, whereas a medication like vetolizumab might be slower acting. It'll get there, but it, uh, you know, it, it might just be delayed. And so that's why I think sort of a cookie cutter approach of everyone needs a CRP at two weeks and a colonoscopy at six months. I mean, I think that that really is sort of the art of this, of sort of looking at what agent are you on, working with your provider and figuring out when to time those specific assessments. Um, but I do think that you'll find that there's quite a bit of variability in onset and offset when you stop therapy of how long it takes to get out of the system. Nothing more to add. Agreed completely. <laughs> awesome. Um, so the next question is, will I be at risk of developing an antibody against a biologic drug if I switch to its biosimilar? An excellent Sorry. question. And this is to uh, Dr. Michael and also Dr. Kiyoshin, if you have anything to add. <laughs> Great question. So biosimilars, as Dr. Kiyoshin had mentioned, we think of them as essentially the body sees them as the same medication as the originator medicine. So they work in the same way on the same receptors and the same parts of the immune system. They're even monitored in the same way. So when we order a medication level, um, at least in, in my computer system, it might be the same for Dr. Kiyoshi and I type in infliximab level, even if that patient is on a infliximab biosimilar. And so because of that, because the body sees the medication in the same way, there should not be any increased risk of developing antibodies on a biosimilar than there is on the originator, originator medicine. Now, can you develop antibodies to a biosimilar? Absolutely. Um, but the, and what we were seeing this more in research as well, that the risk of development of antibodies should not be increased just from switching if you keep the medicine dose the same and the infusion interval the same. I completely agree with Dr. Michael. Perfect. Awesome. Um, is there ever a place of, uh, or sorry, is there ever a place for tapering off of a biologic if someone has been symptom free and reached histolic remission for several years? And also um, with this, please, if you could explain what histolic remission is for those in the audience who might not know. Um, thank you, Dr. Kashian. Okay, sure. Um, so yeah, so remember we talked about the different layers of what we use as our endpoints of to tell us that a treatment is successful, right? We talked about symptoms, biomarkers, and I'm sorry, I know I'm starting to sound like a repeat, but again, I want patients to sort of get this in their mind that this is sort of what goes on in my mind when I'm thinking. Well, histologic healing, so I take biopsies during a colonoscopy of the colon or the small intestine, and I find no evidence of active inflammation. That really is probably the holy grail goal to aim for. I think as we get more therapies, I think we will probably start thinking about that. And a lot of our current clinical trials are including a combination of not just my appearance on the colonoscopy, endoscopic healing, but also histologic healing. But I do think that um, that is something that is thought in, in what we know today to be a really positive prognosticator with reduced risk of things like colon cancer and hospitalization and surgery. So I think what the what the savvy uh, question asker is saying is that you know this is sort of a, another level of a positive prognosis, right? And so yes, I would much rather have a discussion about reducing or changing therapy with someone that's in that state as opposed to someone with you know continued elevation of C-reactive protein and inflammation in the colon. But I do think that um, the question of who to safely do that in is still an important question. Um, and I think that you'll find that even in those perfect ideal situations, stopping therapy, reducing therapy could result in a flare of symptoms. And I think that sort of the additional piece to keep in mind is that some of these biologics, especially as we've been talking about antibodies, with a long holiday from these biologics, there is a higher risk of developing antibodies. Now, if you stop it electively, that's not a major risk, but it's, it's something to consider. In other words, we may not be able to come back to it 
But I think right now, the guidance is de-escalation from dual therapy to monotherapy is reasonable, but stopping or reducing is probably not something that, that has a lot of evidence that can guide me and my and my uh, patient in, in our shared decision-making. So uh, Dr. Michael, I'm interested in your thoughts on that. Exactly the same. <laughs> um, exactly the same. I, and one theme, as I'm seeing many of the wonderful questions in the chat too, which maybe this will help answer as well, folks will ask, you know, how do you, how do we balance the risks and the benefits? Um, and one thing I think that's really important is that it's so individualized. So for, for one patient, the benefits of de-escalating from two medicines to one, um, or going from one medicine to no medicines, uh, the risk of that may be very, very high. You know, maybe they were very sick when they were first diagnosed, which means that it might be harder to get them under control in the long term. Maybe they've already had been on many, many medicines. And if they we stop a medicine and they lose risk or they have a flare of disease again, we won't be able to help heal them because we don't have that big of a toolkit anymore. Um, on the other hand, maybe someone had very mild disease. They were taking, I don't know, maybe a mesalamine, an oral medication for 10 years. Actually, I saw a patient like this today in, in the office. He shared with me today that he felt great and he had been, he had not been taking his medicine for the past year. <laughs> and I said, okay, well, let's get your blood work, get your stool calprotectin. And if those things are normal and you're feeling good and you had mild disease, I'm okay monitoring you off medicine, but I definitely want to see you in clinic, get the blood and the stool markers. And if those start increasing, get another scope and talk about restarting therapy. So it, it was super, super individualized. And you might have the same patient or two different patients with similar scenarios and you make different decisions with them based on their preferences and, and what's important to them. That I think was a great, uh, a really great piece of insight that I think addressed, yeah, a lot of the questions that people have been having. So thank you for that. Um, Dr. Kiyashian, can you comment on what we know so far about IBD medication effects as people age, um, specifically in like maybe elder patients or patients who are a bit older? That's a good question. Um, yeah, so, um, so I do think that... Um, we have to recognize that um, just as we have an aging U.S. population, we also have an aging inflammatory bowel disease population, right? Up to something like 25% of the population will be uh, over age 60, 65 by uh, 2060. Um, and so and maybe even sooner. Um, and so I think to me, um, <clears throat> there's been, there's a lot of recent um, interest and excitement in looking at this population as patients are getting older, you know, diagnosed with IBD in their 20s and 30s and now in their 50s and 60s. Um, and um, I think that some of the things that hopefully are starting to change is that, for example, a lot of our clinical trials thus far have had sort of an upper limit on enrollment, you know, age 75, age 70, whatever the case might be. And so we don't have sort of that, that nice, robust data to say which medication may be more effective, may be less effective. The other thing, if you look at surveys of patient of providers of of um, how do they feel? Do they feel comfortable prescribing medications to older adults? You'll generally find that um, some of the therapies that have proven benefit in younger patients are often shied away from in older adults because of risk of you know maybe lack of data or worry about risk and benefit. And studies consistently show that if you undertreat uh, patients just because of something like age, um, you can result in worse outcomes. So still picking the agent that's probably most likely to be effective in the management of these patients is important regardless of what age um, and what stage of life they're in. And so I think to me, um, there is um, there are what's helping us sort of bridge, uh, you know, bridge that gap uh, in terms of the clinical trials our center experiences and national population studies where we're actually seeing, you know, older patients are being studied on specific therapies, how effective are they, how safe are they? And I think what we're generally finding is that the management can be quite similar. Um, and, uh, and I think to me, the same approaches in terms of picking an agent, in terms of, um, you know, moving forward with monitoring 
are just as relevant in those over age 60 or 65 as those in their 30s. There are some nuances, you know, keeping in mind there are other medical conditions, insurance coverage and some Medicare, um, you know, differences in coverage and, 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 and things like that. Mm -hmm. But I do think the approach should still be sort of the same, uh, you know, in my mind moving forward. I hope that addressed the question. Yeah, I, I totally think so. Um, I, I mean, I'm not the person who asked the question, but <laughs> um, so this is actually a really interesting question, um, kind of more about research. I saw this myself. There was an article recently released in Nature Journal about a gene showing potential in IBD therapy. Um, can you comment maybe on what we should be taking away from that article or um, maybe your insights on that article? Um, and this is to both doctors, if uh, either of you wants to start. Well, I have not read that article, so I cannot comment directly on it, but clearly I need to read that article. Um, but what I will say just about genetics and IBD uh, at a high level is that one of the biggest challenges with genes and IBD um, and using genes to treat IBD or modifying genes to treat IBD is that there's not just one gene that causes IBD. So there are other diseases out there. For example, if folks have heard of cystic fibrosis, where there's one gene with lots of multiple different things that can go wrong with it, but there's one gene that, that researchers and doctors can target to treat or fix or change to help with cystic fibrosis symptoms. With IBD, there are hundreds of genes that have been associated with the development of it and so there's not a one, a one gene stop to, if we fix that gene, everyone with IBD will be cured. And so um, I think interest in modifying genes is there. Um, and I'm very excited to look up this article and read it myself, but it is definitely not gonna be a one-stop shop, if you will. Um, and I'll, with that, I'll hand it to Dr. Kiashian. Yeah, I, I mean, I agree with you. I think that, uh, you know, I don't think, you know, the genetics is um, interesting, especially some of the work that's been done to sort of predict disease course in the future, but it's very much in infancy. It's not sort of a perfect um, model. And I think that there are some some clinical models like in Crohn's disease that you can find where you can look at some clinical parameters or genetics or biomarkers and get a sense of where their disease is going to be in three or five years. But again, those are not perfect models. I think the area of genetics that's really exciting and, and maybe biomarkers along those lines is a lot of these clinical trials also, in addition to the agent that they're using, they're also including an assessment of maybe genetics or biomarkers to see if we can truly get to personalized therapy. You know, in other words, if we identify after we do the study that patients with this genetic profile or maybe this biomarker profile responded more robustly than not, then that would help in our decision making. So for a patient of mine who's got ulcerative colitis, we know we've got to move forward with a biologic or, or a um, uh, a small molecule, and we sort of are kind of picking, uh, you know, randomly. I do think a lot of where genetics and biomarkers will play a role in the future is helping personalize, um, you know, what therapy works for your, because we, we talk about one, it's not really one Crohn's disease, right? There are multiple different pathways that result in what we perceive as a diagnosis of Crohn's disease. And that's why some therapies work and others don't. But I do think that that's where probably genetics and biomarkers are going to be really helpful in the hopefully near future. Thank you so much uh, for your insights, both of you. Um, next question here, are there any special considerations with some of the targeted synthetic small molecules? So why might some of those require EKGs um, and other types of pre-medication work like that? Um, and this is for uh, both doctors, Dr. Michael, if you'd like to start maybe. Absolutely. And, and um, I will say too, that these medicines, I think have been used a little bit longer and a little bit more often in the adult world. So especially the cardiac bits. So I'm going to have Dr. Kiyashian focus on that. I'll comment maybe to start on the small molecules, tofacitinib and upadacitinib. Um, those medications, uh, there, there are some considerations that we think about before starting them. Um, one of them is infection risk, and that that really applies for many, many of our medicines, right? Because so many of them have some degree of immunosuppression. So when it comes to uh, the, those small molecules, which are called JAK inhibitors, 
We think about general infection risk and encourage um, vaccines amongst our patients, any vaccines that they can get, the inactivated ones. We also think about the risk of something called shingles and en encourage sh the Shingrix vaccine to prevent that. Um, we do a baseline lipid panel screening. So we get folks cholesterol and triglyceride levels, and then we monitor those after we start the medicine um, because some patients have increased levels of their lipids on the JAK inhibitors. And most of the time you don't have to do anything about it. You know, we encourage healthy, healthy diet and exercise. Um, very rarely people might need medicine to treat the lipids, but that said, if they need the medicine for their IBD and it's working, the risk balance may be worth it. Um, let's see here. And then the other things are, are similar to what we would do for monitoring in all patients with IBD that Dr. Kiyashi mentioned, cancer screenings, skin cancer, and so on. Um, so that's just an example of maybe the small molecules. And then I'll, I'll hand it over to Dr. Kiyashi for other thoughts and specifically considerations with, with the cardiac effects of some of the new drugs. Sure. Yeah, that's Michael. A lot of the, as you know, a lot of the clinical trials, um, you know, might look at the mechanism of, oh, this must, because we know it can be present in cardiac tissue or it can have an impact on cardiac tissue, we have to monitor things like blood pressure and the pulse and an EKG to look at specific patterns on the EKG, right? But we also realize, so that's part of the clinical trial. They, they report that out. They tell you what um, things they found, like maybe we found a little bit of a change in the pulse, a little bit of the blood pressure. But then we really also look at that post-marketing time of safety monitoring after the drug has been out um, and what exactly happens. And so that's why you see a lot of the monitoring that occurs early on for a medication may be different three to five years later, as we sort of get more data and realize that perhaps there's less of a concern. So one such area is, you know, um, EKG changes um, for specific small molecules. And I think that in the post-marketing, and we, we've been to national conferences, Dr. Michael and I, and I think you sort of see these large cohorts of patients that they've monitored where concerns for um, you know, those things are really not major concerns in terms of risk. I think Dr. Michael laid out very nicely the risks of things like JAK inhibitors. And so I think to me, um, I think it's important to sort of speak with your provider about, you know, what is the purpose of this test? Why do they do it? And they can delve into some of those nuances with you, but realize that some of that may just be the way it was marketed and done in the clinical trials. And we may move away from that as we find that really it's not relevant five years later. Thank you. Um, and for our final question of the night, um, is it safe to combine this combine steroid medications with biologic medications. Um, Dr. Kiyashin, if you'd like to start, um, and then Dr. Michael, if you'd like to add anything. It's it's a good question. Um, so, so here's what I would say. I would say that, remember that in my slides, when we talked about the role of corticosteroids in inflammatory bowel disease, these are medications that are meant to induce remission, induce response, right? They're, so they're gonna help you when a patient needs to get better sooner, but remember, the key is to have in mind what's going to take over that healing, right? That's the important piece. And so I think to me, oftentimes steroids serve as what we call a bridge. They basically, you know, you know you're going to start a new therapy, whatever you end up picking, and you need your patient is quite active in terms of symptoms and you want to get them some improvement in quality of life. Um, and so oftentimes steroids are used and can be overlapped with biologics. But the key is to have that idea of how do I optimize this biologic? My goal is to come off steroids um, and then move forward with just that agent while I'm using this bridge here to make the patient feel better until that works. One other consideration to add um, is when patients are on, because some, sometimes you do need that combination, um, one or two, sometimes even three immunosuppressive medicines at once. And so when, and just for the limited amount of time, like Dr. Kiyashian said, until you can ideally peel things away um, to, the, to the least risky combination that gets the job done, right? I, I've talked to my patients a lot and I said, the best medicine is kind of the lowest effective dose that keeps your gut healed because then you're decreasing the risk of side effects. One thing to think about when you're on multiple immunosuppressive medicines is at times you have to take you have to be aware of other infections that you may be at higher risk for. And so, for example, um, if someone is on three immunosuppressive medicines at once, usually we start a preventative antibiotic 
um, called Bactrim three times a week to help prevent a particular infection that patients are at increased risk for. So that would be one other thing to think about is at some, at some point we got to throw the kitchen sink at patients because it's, it's really important to help heal their gut. Um, but being aware of infection risk and, and you doing everything we can to prevent infection in those scenarios is super important. Thank you both so much for answering all of these um, honestly wonderful questions that we've uh, received throughout the night. Um, so as our program comes to an end, on behalf of the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation, we encourage you to keep learning about IBD and visit our helpful education resources. Um, for more information on medications, check out the IBD Medication Guide. The IBD Medication Guide allows you to filter and sort medications um, based on certain options such as disease, drug class, and preferred way to take medication. Um, additionally, there's the IBD Help Center. The IBD Help Center provides information and resources to patients, caregivers, and healthcare providers about inflammatory bowel disease. They're available by phone or email, as well as live chat, currently available Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday. Um, and there's a QR code there for that. Um, and additionally, there are so many support resources and support groups. Um, if you're looking to connect with other patients and caregivers, the foundation offers both virtual and in-person support groups. Um, the, the QR code on the bottom right of your screen will help you locate a support group near you. Um, finally, to watch previous webinars and expert conversations, please visit Crohn'sColitisFoundation.org slash myIBDLearning. Um, just a quick reminder, um, We'd love if you'd fill out the evaluation survey that will be sent to you after tonight's program. Um, we really appreciate the feedback and it'll help us plan future programs. Uh, thank you again to both Dr. Michael and Dr. Kiyashian. Um, it has just been a wonderful evening and thank you also to everyone in the IBD community who has joined tonight um, and have a wonderful rest of your evening. Thank you so much.